Behold, a photograph of our home galaxy, the Milky Way, in all of its glory. Just look at those spiral arms. But how was this photo taken? Down here on Earth, we're stuck within the plane of our galaxy's disk. This is why the Milky Way appears as a band in the night sky. We're seeing our galaxy edge on, like viewing a frisbee from the side. Trying to map the Milky Way galaxy from Earth is a lot like trying to map MIT's campus or your own neighborhood while standing in one spot on the ground. You might be able to see some of the stuff around you, but much more is obscured, so you can't see what the area looks like beyond your point of view. The best way to get a good map is by viewing the place from above. From high up here, it's much easier to see how MIT's buildings are positioned relative to each other to create the campus map. There's a problem though. If you want to take a photo of the galaxy from above, you need to get a camera there. And there is a vantage point which is tens of thousands of light years away. That makes it tens of millions of times farther away than the farthest spacecraft we've ever launched. It also means that even if we did have a camera there, it would take tens of thousands of years for the signal to return to us. So-called photos of the Milky Way galaxy, then, are actually just artists' conceptions. That doesn't mean we have to give up, though. We have a clever tool at our disposal, if we want that picture of the galaxy. Radio astronomy. Radio astronomy allows us to take advantage of the natural properties of the most common thing in the galaxy, clouds of hydrogen gas, and piece together a portrait of our home galaxy, the Milky Way. Hydrogen gas naturally emits low-energy radio waves, which we can detect back here on Earth. If we aim a radio telescope into the plane of our galaxy, we collect radio waves from the various hydrogen gas clouds which lie along our line of sight. Normally, all of these radio waves would be near the frequency of 1420.4 MHz, but the waves from gas clouds moving away from us are stretched out and are thus at a slightly lower frequency. The opposite is true for waves from gas which is moving towards us. As a result, the data we receive from the telescope tells us how fast the gas is moving in the direction we're looking. If we can predict how fast different parts of the galaxy are moving, then we can work out where the gas must be concentrated along our line of sight to make the particular blend of radio waves which we observe. A lot of gas all moving at one speed, for instance, indicates a denser region of orbiting gas possibly as part of a spiral arm. If we apply a heaping dose of trigonometry, we can plot these gas concentrations along a line of sight we were using in the galaxy. If we repeat this process over and over again along slightly different lines of sight into the galaxy's disk, we can start to plot where the gas is concentrated in multiple areas, and thus begin to map out the shape of the galaxy. Watch as we keep filling in the map. At the end of the day, we have something that looks like this. Whoa! See those arcs of higher density? Those are sections of spiral arms in our very own galaxy. We managed to paint a partial portrait of the Milky Way without even having to leave the MIT campus. What's even better is that we're not the first people to have tried to find a map of the galaxy this way. This approach was first used by Kerr, Ort, and Westerhout in the 1950s. If we compare our map to theirs, we find that we agree on the locations of several important features. Today, we know that this larger section is part of the Perseus arm, this shorter bit is part of the Sagittarius arm, and this more distant piece is known as the outer arm of the Milky Way. We managed to make this map with little more than a radio telescope and some trigonometric know-how. Cool! So we're done, right? Well, not quite. One useful piece of information we'd like to have about our galaxy is its rotation curve which is a graph of how fast things orbit in the galaxy as a function of how far they are from its center. What might the Milky Way galaxy's rotation curve look like? Before we apply the data, let's try to figure out what we're expecting. Thankfully, the physics of orbits is a field of study stretching back centuries. Kepler's third law states that there is a relationship between the time it takes an object to complete its orbit and how big its orbit is. If you rearrange the math a bit, you end up with this relationship. We expect that the velocity of objects in orbit will be proportional to the inverse square root of the orbit's radius. Going back to our telescope's data, we already know that the frequencies of the radio waves tell us how fast gas clouds are moving. 
We can work out that the fastest gas cloud we observe is the one which is the closest to the center of the galaxy, because its orbital velocity carries it along our line of sight, so we see the most exaggerated speed. With a bit of trigonometry, we can then find how far that point is from the center of our galaxy. The trick is to repeat this calculation for different lines of sight into the galaxy. Doing so allows you to create the graph of the rotation curve. Since we already have a model of what we're expecting the rotation curve to look like, let's scan through the galaxy with our radio telescope and find the actual rotation curve. We gather a bunch of scans, crunch the numbers, and... Wait a minute, these don't look alike at all. Something must have gone wrong. Or, or did it? It turns out that this experiment has been repeated all over the world many times over, and every time people find this shape for the rotation curve. The rotation curve we observe doesn't match how Kepler told us it should look. Was Kepler wrong? Not quite. We can also try flipping our reasoning and asking, what would have to be different about our galaxy in order to see this kind of rotation curve? It turns out that you expect exactly this kind of curve if the galaxy has a lot more stuff in it in a particular arrangement. But when we look out where this stuff should be, we don't see anything. This stuff doesn't interact with other normal matter or with light, both of which pass right through. But it does interact gravitationally and provides enough extra heft to the galaxy that things orbit at the speeds we observe. This is indirect evidence for the existence of the mysterious dark matter, whose composition and properties are an open problem in science right now. We have, as of yet, never observed dark matter directly, but we can tease out signs of its existence from work like these observations. It's amazing that we can find indirect evidence for something like dark matter while trying to do something else entirely, like taking a picture of the galaxy. These kinds of serendipitous finds happen all over the place in science, but it's particularly amazing here, given that the tools used were just a telescope which looks a lot like a satellite dish, and the hydrogen gas floating throughout the galaxy. Radio astronomy, while simple, is powerful enough to save the day.